Loving God, your presence stirring within me calls me to a new way of life. May the desire, my desire is to follow your will, but I am not sure what that is. Grant me patience to keep listening and to allow your dream to unfold within me. Grant me wisdom to recognize your whisperings and in every moment of my life. Grant me courage to respond in a faith-filled love. Thank you for your guidance and for your myster mysterious gift, which is awakening within me. Amen. Amen. Well, it is with joy that I'm here today with you all. Um, for those of you who just popped in, my name is Sister Maria Victoria, and I am with the Benedictine Sisters of Perpetual Adoration in Clyde, Missouri, which is in the Northwest corner. I always like to say our monastery is between a cornfield and a pasture. <laughs> it's a beautiful place, but it is out there in the cornfield. <laughs> <laughs> Literally speaking. Um, and the other thing I wanted to share before I begin is thank you for your service. Thank you for your call to serving our country and our world. So thank you for that. Thank you. And um, so I will begin in the very beginning. I was born in Argentina. Buenos Aires, which is where the pope, current Pope is from, Pope Francis. And I moved to the United States when I was three and a half. And my family and I moved to Metairie, Louisiana, which is right outside of New Orleans. And so I grew up speaking Spanish and English um, all of my life. And uh, Mardi Gras is a very big thing in my family. So hence Mardi Gras decorations behind me year round, <laughs> literally. And, um, but really growing up, um, faith was just not something we talked about. It was either that we uh, read, it, read it in books or actually learned in school. Um, I went to Catholic school up until second grade and then I moved to public school. So for me, I began very curious. I, I was an avid reader when I was little and my Mom and dad and I and my older sister went to mass on Sundays because we knew it was uh, what we were called to do. But it really wasn't until middle school that I began to be a little bit more curious about my faith. And, and so I came across a parish bulletin that was just laying around in my house. And I saw that they were gonna be starting CCD classes soon. So I said to my mom, if it was all right with her, if I could go ahead and um, start taking some classes. And she's like, sure, fine. Why not, but you gotta pay for it. And so I said, okay, that's fine by me. And so I started babysitting and doing, doing all that stuff. And while I was taking that class of uh, the CCD classes, I started actually getting jealous of the kids during the day because they were in religion class five days a week and I was only in there for one. And so I, I, I was just like, no, this is, there's something wrong here. <laughs> so I began reading and, and got a hold as much as I could grab. And then of course, life happened and um, I finished middle school, went on to high school. In high school, I was very involved in the band. Uh, I was in ROTC. I was in a number of activities. Um, 
And so kind of religion kind of fell out of the back burner of my mind. Um, and then I began dating. And it wasn't until after high school that I was in a very serious relationship with a guy. And um, two years after high school, he kind of asked me to marry him. And it wasn't until he popped that question to me that I was just like, huh? I literally had to stop and say, you know, I can't give you an answer right now. <laughs> I have to really think about it. Because I was thinking, is this really what I want to do for the rest of my life? Is be married to him? And it's not that we were in a bad relationship or not. It was just, wow. And it was during that time of prayer and discernment where I realized God was calling me to something else. It was also during that time I was um, at working at a daycare and in charge of my ones and twos. And I was also going to night school to uh, become an early childhood education teacher. And that was my plan. And I really did not know where to begin. Um, so I prayed about it some more. And, and then I felt God saying, you know, why don't you consider religious life? And I said, well, what about that dude? <laughs> And so I had to break off with him, which was really hard to do, and um, begin my search. And I didn't know where to begin because I didn't really know of any orders in, in New Orleans, except for the Daughters of St. Paul, who they happen to have a bookstore right in Metairie. And it was also that their location director was living there at the time, which was great for me. Um, so I, I went to them and I was like, help, I really don't know where to go. And so the vocation director and I spoke and she gave me a copy of Vision Magazine, which is a very, very helpful tool that has a lot of articles in there about discernment, it, about religious life, the priesthood, everything and anything. And it also has a bunch of ads of religious communities. I didn't really know that there were so many. Um, and so I went home and I read it. And then I also looked up on their website, which they have one. And I took a vocation match quiz that they have. It's kind of like a dating app in a sense. And uh, ask you a lot of personal questions about you, your relationship with God and what you're thinking about and so on. And so I did that. And shortly after I submitted it, I was bombarded by thousands, what felt like thousands of emails from religious orders across the world. Because I really was just beginning and I had no idea. And so in my email, I had a folder of yes, no, and maybe. <laughs> and it really wasn't until I received an email from our place here that really drew my attention. And our former di vocation director at the time um, you know, in a brief little email described who we were, invited me to visit our website. And sure enough, it just so happens that we had a monastic experience coming up. And I was like, well, I've never been to Missouri before. So why not? And, but first I said, I have to talk this over with my family. Now, remember that I told you I'm, I'm from a Hispanic family. So, and this was really hard for me to do because I was going against the current. And um, they really did not understand and they still kind of don't. But my dad was like, do I need to call them? <laughs> Are they real? I'm like, yes, they're real. It's okay. And he really thought this was kind of just a phase that I was going through. So I was 22 at the time. And, and he's like, okay, sure. 
all right, you're only going for a week, so that's fine. And really when I got there, when I got to the Kansas City airport, there was, we, in that monastic experience, there were nine other women um, who had joined me for the week. And they were from all over the United States, which was extremely helpful knowing that I wasn't the only crazy one going to a monastery for a week. Um, so, but on the, in the car ride to the, from the airport to the monastery, which is an hour and 10 minutes. And that's a long time coming from the city. I was look, I remember looking out the window and thinking to myself, we're definitely not in New Orleans anymore. <laughs> it's like, what am I doing here? Um, but then when, when I, we finally got here, it was just something changed within me. And one of the first things that we do with the sisters is we pray evening prayer with them. I had never, ever prayed the Liturgy of the Hours before. I've never even heard of St. Benedict before. And I was just memorized by it all. And I remember just at prayer, kind of looking around in our chapel and looking at the sisters wondering, why are they so joyful? What what what's keeping them here? <laughs> and I was so lost in my book that the sister next to me was like, "Here, let me help you." <laughs> it was like I wasn't even paying attention to what was going on. I was just pen paying attention to everything else. <laughs> and I was just struck by their happiness and their calmness almost. And so that, that same feeling of being at home and being at peace kind of stayed with me throughout the week. And I found myself asking, what is my next step? Because I would like to come back. And um, so she told me, you know, why don't you go home thinking over and we'll go from there. And so I did. And I found myself returning for another two weeks and then entering into the application process um, a couple of weeks later. And then I finally entered in August of 2007. And I made my first vows in uh, December of 2010 and final vows in January of 2014. But I have to backtrack a little bit to you, because uh, I know I mentioned about my, my parents, how difficult it was for them. And it still is. But one of the things that has helped is for them coming to visit and seeing that I am happy in the place where I am at, even though they don't really get it. Um, and, and I'm okay with that as long as they see that I am happy where I'm at is what really matters. And, you know, even though they don't understand my vocation, for me, I, I've been taking it as a learning opportunity in a teaching moment because you never really know what God is doing to somebody else in their own hearts. And could it be that God brings us people in our, in our lives that may not understand what we're doing as an opportunity to, to show them, to teach them? to help them understand in their own way. I, I'd like to share with you a little quick story, if that's okay. Um, when I was on my home visits, cause we get two weeks of, of vacation. And one of my home visits, I was able to, my grandparents had come from Argentina 
to visit the, around the same time. And these were my dad's parents who were, they're both no longer with us. Um, but my, my grandparents on my dad's side also were struggling with me entering religious life. And um, one of the things that my grandpa shared with me was, you know, I, you know, I, I don't understand why you do what you do. And so it just so happens that one day when I was walking in, on the streets in Argentina, I came across another sister and I stopped her. And I said to her, this is my grandfather talking. And I, and I said to her, can, can I ask you a question? And she's like, sure and she and he goes well why are you dressed the way you're dressed and and what is it what, why do you do what you do and she goes sir what is it that you do and he goes well i'm a carpenter and he's like she's like do you like being a carpenter and he's like yes i really do like being a carpenter and she goes well, I really like being a religious sister. It, and, and after his sharing that story with me, um, he's like, you know, and I've been pondering that ever since. Because then, then he's like, then I realize that we all have we're called to do something in this life. It may not be the same thing, but we are all called in different ways. And it was like for him, it, 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 was, it was a way for him to acknowledge it and be okay with it. And so I, I always like to share that because we're all called to to serve Christ in his own way that he has called us, whether it be through marriage, single life, priesthood. And it's amazing that we're all in this together, no matter, no matter how he's calling us. Sister, I love, I love your story. I think I've heard your story three times now and I just love it. I, and I actually hadn't heard the part about your grandpa before, but I love the simplicity of her answer to him that, that you know, this is, this is what she was called to um, and how we're all called to something. And I also really love in your story that at a point maybe in your life where it looked like God was calling you to a very different vocation, that was the moment he chose to, to say, no, wait, I have a different plan for you. Um, and that you were open, open and heard that call and, and, took the... and it was scary yeah. at first because I thought I had my own plan, <laughs> my, you know, it, it, and it's true what they say, you know, tell God your plans and he'll laugh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And now that I look back, it's like, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so oh, wonderful well, sister. I have, a, I have one question for you. Um, and, and we'll see if anyone else has questions for you as well. But um, I know it's been an interesting journey with your parents and helping them understand your vocation. But we've talked a lot this weekend about um, vocations for our sons and, you know, mm -hmm. bringing them to the priesthood. But as a religious sister, what would you, what would you tell us as women um, that we can do to foster vocations in our daughters? Um, do you have any words words on that? I do. Yay. <laughs> I I welcome it. You know, um, embrace it with them as a possibility, because you never know. Um, hey, I was dating during the time, <laughs> so it it could be a bonding moment uh between you and your daughter or your son as hey have you ever thought considered being a sister or have you ever considered the priesthood or a religious vocation um you know and then talk to you to help that way it'll kind of help you 
in your own journey. I know I've come across women who, who have said, I wish I would have at least entertained that thought. Because who knows where I would be right now if, if I hadn't. And even if God is not calling them to a religious community, um, could it be that God is calling them to a deeper relationship with him? And that's important too. Uh, and just, just be open to, you know, talking about it. And it can be difficult. It really can. Uh, because sometimes there's no real words around it and all sorts of emotions and feelings come up and those are all normal and it's just part of part of life walking through it but kind of tiptoeing and um kind of dipping your toe in the in the river or in the stream as they say <laughs> That's beautiful advice. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have anything they want to ask Sister after she shares shared her story? 